The end of the Great Ice Age shaped the world we live in today. A mass of water poured into the oceans as the ice caps melted. Sea level rose 400 feet. Floods swallowed up the best coastal lands on Earth. All traces of the people who'd lived on them vanished beneath the sea. Could this mass flooding have been the inspiration for hundreds of flood myths from all around the world? We're told the flood myths are just that, myths, and should not be taken seriously. But in India, new evidence from the bottom of the sea is showing substance to the myths. This is the Gulf of Cambay in northwest India. In late 2001, scientists doing pollution studies made an astonishing accidental discovery. Twenty-five miles from shore, at a depth of 120 feet, they picked up traces of two ancient cities covering a large area of the seabed. The discovery threatens to overturn everything that archaeologists have believed about the origins of civilization. They found two cities the size of Manhattan with massive walls and plazas. And man-made objects from the submerged cities have yielded carbon dates up to 9,500 years old. That's about 5,000 years older than any city discovered by archaeologists anywhere. It means we could be dealing with a civilization lost at the end of the Ice Age. Perhaps even one of those that the flood myths speak of, which flourished before history began. I'm keen to test the idea that ancient civilizations could have flourished in coastal areas during the Ice Age. When the ice melted and the seas rose, the floods obliterated the coastal civilization. The survivors recorded the trauma in myths. Christians, Jews and Muslims all know the story of the biblical flood and Noah's Ark. And Plato's myth of Atlantis is universally famous. But India may have the oldest flood myths in the world. I'm going there to investigate. I begin my journey in the ancient town of Dwarka on the tip of the Gujarat Peninsula. It huddles at the foot of a spectacular medieval temple dedicated to the god Krishna, the most famous of the Indian gods. The temple is built on top of earlier temples, dating back more than 3,000 years. It commemorates a mythical city said to have been established by Krishna before the flood and destroyed. On the same day that Krishna departed from the earth, the ocean submerged Dwarka. The temple is a shrine to Krishna and every day a new flag is raised to commemorate the myth of the submerged city. Every year, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims flock from all corners of India to mingle in its courtyards and bathe in the ocean's sacred waters. But would the myth point the way to an underwater find?
In the 1980s, the Dwarka flood myth received a boost when ruins, immediately presumed to be those of the lost city of Krishna, were discovered in the bay in front of the temple. A leading archaeologist estimated on the basis of a hunch that they were dated to around 1500 BC. But since there's no real evidence for that date, I want to take a look at them myself. A group of marine archaeologists from India's National Institute of Oceanography have agreed to take me diving at Dwarka. This is Dwarka. Yeah. So we're moored over this concentration yeah. of ruins. So are these mainly structure. individual blocks? Or are they no, individual boys which we tied for the particular structure. I see. Okay. So now the blocks are scattered. Yes. I'm working with marine archaeologists Sri Sundaresh and Dr. Gaur. There's no wall as such. Because we have to go down here and we should come we up. We follow the line up. of the ridge. Okay. What's hard looking at structures underwater is to be sure whether strange looking objects are just weird natural formations or whether they've been cut and shaped by man. It becomes clearer when you find clean cut individual blocks like these. The next question with any underwater site is how old is it? This site is so shallow and close to the shore that recent earthquakes could have submerged it, not necessarily rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age. So it wasn't a big surprise to learn that Sundaresh and Gaur are now dismissing these finds that are merely hundreds of years old. This clearly can't be the ruins of the ancient mythical city of Dwarka. Stone anchors of a type made in India in the Middle Ages prove that the ships of that time once moored here. So anchors uh, precisely we are dating between 8th century AD to 14th century AD. Mm -hmm. So I think a structure also may, be fall, may fall in that period. So we're talking actually about yeah. a medieval yeah, site? Yeah, medieval period. Do you accept the conventional dating of 1500 BC or so for this site or do you think we should put a big question mark over that date? I think, you, I think you have answered the question. <laughs> we should put a big question mark over yeah, I mean, we have not found any material evidence on which we can be sure about the date. Right. Uh, till we find uh, any datable uh, uh, material artifact, mm -hmm. we'll have to continue our search as and when we can. Yeah. Have you ever gone like 10 kilometers out that way? So for 10 kilometers away from here, no, we have not dived. The, uh, so we, the we have gone up to two, meter, uh, two kilometers. Mm -hmm. To support my theory of a much older origin for civilization, I need a flood myth directly connected to large-scale underwater ruins more than 8,000 years old. I now know that Dwarka's ruins definitely aren't that old. But what they do testify to is the continuous flooding of this coastline. And the science tells us that we're here inland to what was once an enormous antediluvian domain, extending more than 50 kilometers out to sea. The archaeological surveys here haven't even begun to test the myth. They have to go out, far out from shore and into deeper water. The myth of Dwarka is part of a larger and older cycle of Indian myths that speak of a flood survivor, Manu, who becomes the father of future mankind. Like the biblical Noah, Manu builds a survival ship, takes the seeds of essential plants as a way of restoring agriculture, rides out the deluge in his ark, and comes to rest at last on a mountaintop. Typically, Manu is described as a great rishi or sage and as a master of yoga. His mission is to rekindle civilization after the flood. Could science give this myth any support? Was India ever flooded in such a cataclysm?
To find out, I travelled to the north of England, to my old university, Durham, to meet one of the world's leading specialists on sea level rise, Dr Glenn Milne of the Department of Geology. Drawing on the latest data, he's able to produce computer simulations of how coastlines would have looked at different stages of the Ice Age. Here we see the Indian continent around 21,000 years ago. Yeah. And if we focus in on the northwestern part, you can see a lot of the um, coastline was exposed. No, it's a huge area exposed. A huge area exposed of the continental shelf. So we progress forward to 13 and a half. Mm -hmm. Now you Big see... Big change. Yeah, Very dramatic. Uh, island developing off the west coast of India. To me, that's an extraordinary vision, it's a, it's a, because we know it's not there now. It's like a ghost island. You'll notice as we progress further through time that the Gulf of Kambi gradually gets more and more flooded. 12.4, mm -hmm. 10.6, yep. 7.7 mm -hmm. to 6.9, bang. Ah, huge so, change. Quite dramatic. Well, but in that 800-year window, the Gulf of Cambay is inundated. What interests me is that the flooded domains of India's northwest lie side by side with India's oldest and most mysterious civilization, the Indus Valley Civilization, so-called because its first cities were found along the Indus River. It's one of the least understood cultures from the ancient world and believed to be the biggest, covering more than a million square miles. It flourished about the time the pyramids were built in Egypt. But I'm interested in it because even the most conservative archaeologists think its roots go back much further to small-scale settlements dating to the end of the Ice Age when Glenn Milne's maps show that huge floods ravaged India. Could the Indus Valley civilization be the missing link to lost cities of the underworld that I'm seeking? To find out, I'm going to Dolavira in the lonely salt marshes of the Ran of Kutch. It's one of the largest and best preserved ancient cities of the Indus Valley civilization. To explore the missing link, I'm searching for clues about its heritage and the ideas that made it tick. Archaeologist Dr. Bisht has been working on the whole Indus Valley mystery. Can you actually say how old the site is? Are you sure of that? It's around 3,000 before Christ. 5,000 years ago. 5,000 years ago, that's correct. A small fortress was laid out here, quite a strong one. That fortress was converted to a castle. Around that fortress, a really sophisticated city developed. Mm -hmm. They knew how to write, but unlike the Egyptian hieroglyphs, nobody's ever found a way to crack the code of their enigmatic script. Mm -hmm. They knew a lot about urban planning and the necessities of urban life, the sort of knowledge that only comes from centuries, perhaps thousands of years of accumulated experience. 5,000 years ago, they were designing a water system that was way ahead of its time, including rock-hewn reservoirs built to fight a deteriorating climate and a series of savage droughts. Civilization like this doesn't emerge overnight. As the climate changed around them, the ancient inhabitants of Dolavira made themselves masters of water and water engineering. They cut this huge cistern out of solid rock, and then they lined it with beautifully cut pieces of masonry. It's a wonderful achievement to keep and preserve the water through the dry times to ensure the population's needs were met. The people who built this amazing city 5,000 years ago were at the end of a cycle, not the beginning. But for my investigation, the big question is just how far back does the Indus Valley culture go? 
Is it possible to trace it back to its source? Just like this. So it would be fair to say that the glory of this site is between 3000 BC and 2000 BC, really. That's good. That's good. What about before 3000 BC? Before 3000 BC, what was there, we do not know. There might not be any culture, possibly, or we may find in future some earlier phases as well. But archaeologists have already found related sites in the foothills of the Himalayas that date back much further. They're simple farming settlements, hundreds of miles from the sea, near high mountains. Places that would have made a natural refuge for the survivors of the floods that I now know took place in northwest India at exactly the same time. Is it a coincidence that the ancient Indian tradition of Manu speaks of a flood that destroyed a former civilization and of survivors who retreated to the mountains to start again? The myth of Manu is part of a vast oral tradition that includes the Vedas, India's most ancient scriptures. Most experts think the Vedas were composed around 1500 BC, too late to shed any light on the then extinct Indus Valley civilization and on our investigation. But might the experts be wrong? The Vedas are part of modern day India, an oral tradition that's been memorized and handed down for more than 3000 years. But if an oral tradition can survive for that long, why not for six or even 9,000 years? Could we find in the Vedas a clue to the missing link between the Indus Valley people and the end of the Ice Age? When the first Indus Valley sites were excavated in the early 20th century, the city of Mohenjo-daro revealed a startling new discovery. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are back in 1500 BC and are looking out over the straight streets and brick houses of Mohenjo-daro. Suddenly, smoke and flames begin to rise amongst them. And up one of the main streets, there streams a horde of swordsmen led by a swaying figure in an outlandish chariot. The story I'm telling you is not fantasy. It is a literal interpretation of actual discovery. This is where one of the massacres took place. Sir Mortimer Wheeler was one of the 20th century's most influential experts on the Indus Valley civilization and helped to shape the accepted view of its origin. 34 centuries after it happened, the archaeologists of the 20th century found these bones of the massacred mute evidence of how an age-long civilization perished within the hour. Wheeler was one of those who believed that groups of marauding nomads invaded India from the north and west around 1500 BC. According to this Aryan invasion theory, the Vedas were the scriptures of the nomads, not of the civilized people of the ancient Indus Valley cities. But when archaeologists inspected the skeletons more closely, the invasion theory was cast into doubt. Professor Bibi Lal was a student of Wheeler's at Mohenjo-daro, but questions the conclusions that Wheeler drew from the placing of the skeletons in different levels. Some from the lower levels, some from the middle levels, some from the top levels, and some of them belong, belong even to a period after the abandonment of the site. So when they don't belong to one and the same level, how can they belong to, the, uh, uh, to a massacre by invading Aryans? In fact, they hadn't even died in battle. When examined, the skeletons had indeed come from different strata, meaning that they died at different times. The Aryan invasion theory should have died too. But since it was taught as established fact for most of the 20th century, it dies hard. Now, new linguistic evidence is also undermining the invasion theory. 
Leading archaeologists think it's likely that the language in which the Vedas are expressed has been evolving in India for more than 8,000 years, and so couldn't possibly have been introduced by Aryan invaders just 3,500 years ago. Perhaps it's time to consider a possibility that most archaeologists still find unthinkable, that the Vedas are the scriptures of the Indus Valley civilization itself. I went to the Indian capital, Delhi, to discuss the problem with Dr. David Frawley, one of the very few Westerners recognized as a teacher of the Vedas. So we have this wonderful culture, apparently, with no literature, right. nothing whatsoever. And then we have this wonderful literature. Which is the largest in the ancient world. Exactly. And, and, and deep and sophisticated and incredibly right. well thought out. Right. And, and no culture to attach it to. And they no won't, civilization. They, they they won't, won't take the even, next step. Even though they both come from the same area, yeah. they won't connect them. The result, says Frawley, has been a huge missed chance to know more about the amazing Indus Valley civilization and to explore its mysterious origins. The Vedas have been given to us as the literature of India, so they are connected with that culture. Now, if we put the two together, we see the image of a sophisticated culture of kings and rishis. We see in the seals, we see the symbols of spirituality, the symbols of yoga, the gods like Shiva. We see the whole basis of later Hindu civilization, and that's what we should find as the culture itself has continued. And I found an even more direct clue that links the Vedas with the ancient Indus Valley civilization. It's the image of the Indian flood survivor Manu. In the Vedas, he's a long-haired mystic and a master of yoga. The image of just such a mystic, seated in a recognized yoga posture, turns up on a seal more than 4,700 years old, found at the Indus Valley site of Mohenjo-daro. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gohan. Nice to see you here. You. Welcome. I have a question that I want to ask yes. you, which concerns this ancient uh, image. I'm wondering if you recognize this position. This is called as Moolabandhasana. It is said to be seated on the lowermost part of the body. He is trying to raise his energies up. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a very difficult posture yeah. for the practitioners of yoga. In an advanced position, you try to slightly raise yourself and mm -hmm. sit on the yes. heels. And slowly you swing your legs like the wings of the butterfly yes. and slowly bring it down. Yes. In due course, this comes down and touches the floor. Right. right. Which is what we're seeing mm -hmm. here, yes. And the seal tells us that yoga was being practiced in an advanced form nearly 5,000 years ago. Yes. How, how old do you believe yoga actually is? Yoga, we believe, should be around 6,000 years old or even more. Because there was one saint, uh, he is said to have codified all this yoga into a form. But this and is 6,000 years ago 6, years that he ago. codified it, yes. which, which so means that it, it was existing... Much before that. Take both your legs and take them behind. Manu, the Vedic flood survivor, practiced yoga, and we now know the Indus Valley cities honored the image of a yogic sage. How big a leap is it from there to speculate that the Mohenjo-daro figure represents Manu himself and that the Vedas must therefore have been known to the people of the Indus Valley civilization? Archaeologists, too, are noticing a lot of common ground. You find their hierarchy of settlements. You find a hierarchy in their domestic architecture or in public architecture you are finding the same kind of society, highly urban civilization. What archaeology is doing is solving the puzzle of the origins of the, of the Rig Veda. Well, I think so, but it, it is still hotly debated subject. I know it's a hot subject. <laughs> 
In Vedic tradition, civilization was kick-started in India by survivors of a previous civilization from before the flood. Now geologists have discovered a lost river, which suggests the Vedas might have been composed by people who actually witnessed the end of the Great Ice Age. It's another sign that the myths deserve to be taken seriously as historical documents, and that they could be incredibly old. I'm looking for the lost Indian civilizations spoken of in flood myths. India's oldest known civilization can be traced back to the end of the Ice Age. It is cheek by jowl with lands flooded at that time. Today, the Ran of Kutch is one of the most inhospitable areas on Earth. But around the end of the Ice Age, a vast river flowed through it, making it rich and fertile. The river was the Saraswati, and it's repeatedly described in the ancient scriptures. This river, Sarasvati, with fostering current comes forth. The flood flows on, surpassing in majesty and might all other waters, pure in her course from the mountains to the ocean. We don't see such a Sarasvati river today, but your remote sensing technology tells us more of the story. The river Saraswati originated in the Himalayas and flowed down this channel, which is dried up. Still, it can be made out. Yes. With the latest satellite images, we can trace the original course of the river from the Ice Age glacier all the way to the ocean, just as the myth says. You see here, as the dark colored channels, it flowed parallel to the Indus River and took a southward turn and further flowing, it finally joined with the run of Kutch. It seems to be a huge uh, channel at this point. More than 22 kilometers. 22, 22 kilometers 22 wide. kilometers broad. Wow. It is described in the Vedas that it was mightiest river of that time. Mm -hmm. Right, and that would uh, be what sort of period? Certainly the river was flowing 10,000 years and it continued up to say uh, 6,000 years before present. Because the Vedas described the Saraswati when it was in full flow, Dr. Gupta's confirmation that it stopped flowing 6,000 years ago has one obvious implication. At least some parts of the Vedas must have been composed earlier than 6,000 years ago, during what archaeologists call the pre-Harappan period that led up to the Indus Valley civilization. Not only we have the ancient Saraswati River, what is extraordinary is that we find pre-Harappan settlements on the old Saraswati channel. It's revolutionary enough to suggest that the Vedas could date back to the Indus Valley civilization. Today, however, more and more Indian scholars are reaching the view that they could be much older than that. It is not only an issue of Harappan and Vedic civilizations being one and the same, but the fact that the Rigveda was prominently, I would say predominantly, pre-Harappan. Harappan civilization, uh, somewhere I think I have called it the twilight of the Vedic age. The Vedic age ended with the disintegration of the Harappan civilization. And the most amazing discovery might date the Vedas to more than 11,000 years ago. Leading experts from the Geological Survey of India have argued that there are verses which literally depict the glacial meltdown at the end of the Ice Age. I will declare the manly deeds of Indra. He slew the dragon, then disclosed the waters. The waters glided downward to the ocean and many seas filled full with waters. We do find in the Rig Veda dominant symbolism of Indra destroying the dragon who yeah. lives at the foot of the mountains and releasing the waters mm -hmm. to flow into the sea. And this is very much an end of the Ice Age myth where the great glaciers broke up and the whole area of North India became filled with great rivers and became a very important area of habitation. So the symbolism is there of the cataclysm.
But even if the myths are 11,000 years old, they don't help us search for a lost Indian civilization. For that, I still need a major underwater archaeological site in the areas that geology shows were flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Researching Indian archaeological journals, I found a neglected study describing a sunken ruin. It was in an area that I knew had been flooded at the end of the Ice Age. And there's a flood myth pointing straight to it. Here, deep in the Tamil part of South India, one of the most sacred sites is the Minakshi Temple in the ancient city of Madurai. Tamil myths say the temple was established by the survivors of a flood. According to the myths, the survivors had belonged to an earlier and highly advanced civilization. Its most famous achievement before it was swallowed by the sea was a great academy or sangam for the perfection of human knowledge. Sangam means collection. People come together to bring out a great work. What happened to it? Why did it cease to exist? Okay, but yes, there was a big land. So many people were there. The sea came in mm -hmm. and it swallowed the whole thing. That's what people say. Do we have any descriptions of what sort of land it was? That is the most ancient continent in the whole world. The best and the ancient civilization existed there. And it belongs to Tamari. Right, Tamari. and this is about 10,000 years 10, ago. 10,000 years. The Sangam flood myth hints that the remains of a lost civilization more than 10,000 years old are waiting to be discovered underwater around the shores of South India. In fact, the dates given in the myth go back to 11,600 years ago. That's the same time frame given by Plato for the submergence of Atlantis in another ocean. And Ice Age science confirms that huge amounts of additional land were available all around the coast of India in the precise period signaled by the Sangam myth. So you can see, if you focus down here in the southern tip of India, yeah. and Sri Lanka, it looks more or less as it does Pretty at much as it looks now. Yeah. Proceed now to 10.6, 12.4, 16 16.4. Mm -hmm. Well, they're extraordinarily different from how they are today. I mean, we're looking at almost a continuous land mass. So when the ice sheets were at their biggest, sea level was at its lowest. Right. So the next step of my journey is to go to the coast, to search under the waves for the hidden history of that lost, flooded terrain. This is the granite shore temple at Mahabalipuram. It stands overlooking the Bay of Bengal in southeast India and is one of several dozen extraordinary rock-hewn structures scattered along the coast. I first came to this seashore when I was five years old. In fact, I learned to swim here. It always stayed in my memory as a mysterious place with its wonderful granite temples. The structures we can see today are thought to be about 1,300 years old, but the local myth has it that they commemorate an earlier and now lost city. The city builder was a proud and arrogant giant named Bali. And the story goes that he made a city so beautiful, luxurious and ornate, its temples so tall, its reliefs so rich, that the gods became jealous. They sent orders to the god of the sea to let loose his billows. The city was at once overflowed by that furious element. And the lost city of Bali isn't just an old myth. Local fishermen know all about it because it affects their livelihood. 
First of all, how, how did you come to know that there are these structures underwater? How did you learn about them? Um, when we throw the nets, they get caught in these pillars. When we tug on the nets, they break. No fish, no pillars. So how many structures underwater? It's not like that. There are stones all on top of one another, dilapidated. Jumbled together. Yes, jumbled together. I can't get permission from the Indian government to dive at Mahabalipuram. But I am able to dive a little further south at Pumpahar. The same experts from the National Institute of Oceanography who I worked with at Dwarke have found a structure that is truly mysterious. It lies almost three miles from the present shoreline at a depth of more than 70 feet. It's important because geologists tell us it was submerged about 11,000 years ago when sea levels rose. Archaeologists know of no culture of that time capable of building something so large. And it's mysterious because it was flooded at a date when Tamil myths say a high civilization flourished on land that was later swallowed up by the sea. Here, as at Mahabalipuram, underwater structures provide perfect shelters and breeding grounds for fish. Dr. Gower explains before the dive that archaeologists don't believe in lost civilizations 11,000 years old. To construct a so big structure, mm. I think it's about 40 meters in length. It's a big structure. Yeah. yeah. When we come to here in this particular area, if you see the structure, such a big one, mm -hmm. it means they have a very great technology. As we get ready for the first dive, it dawns on me how much I have at stake in the next few hours. Because if the structure I'm about to see really is more than 11,000 years old, then it is almost by definition the work of a lost civilization. We reach bottom at about 70 feet. The visibility is pretty bad. But soon Sundaresh brings me to a sheer wall about twice the height of a man that juts up out of this ancient inundated plain. It doesn't look like it belongs here naturally at all. Sundaresh draws my attention to several heavily overgrown courses of masonry. A little further along, Sundaresh points out a second area of partially exposed construction blocks. As we continue along the U-shaped structure, I see that almost every inch of it is draped in fishermen's nets. It feels a bit eerie. Looking at these straight lines on the walls, you can almost make out courses of masonry. I'm in no doubt that we're looking at a man-made structure here. There is a lot of growth on it. On reviewing the dive on deck, what convinces me is these clear courses of individual blocks. and the way that the U-shaped structure sticks up so unnaturally from the flat sea bed. A computer model of the structure from measurements taken by the NIO reveals the overview that the murky waters hide from divers and shows that other structures stand nearby. 
Perhaps it was an enclosure for ritual purposes. Back on deck, Kamlesh Vora, the expedition leader, confirms that further anomalies have been identified in the same area. There are another uh, port structures around, north of this place and south of this place, mm. where we feel that, or we believe, or we know from the uh, lot of people saying yeah. that uh, there was, uh, there are submerged structures below. This is one place, maybe an isolation. Sure. Yeah. But if three or four structures along the coastline, if yeah. they give us some good yes. unified... And if you uniform, can plot the relationship yes, of the structures to each other. We should put all the data together. And well, it seems to me an area that, that deserves more research. Mysterious. <laughs> mysterious, exactly. <laughs> a couple of months after I dived at Pumpahar, a news story, not picked up elsewhere, appeared in the Indian press announcing the discovery of two lost cities 120 feet under the sea off northwest India precisely where Glenn Milne's maps had shown a huge loss of land at the end of the Ice Age. I felt as though I was being shown the Holy Grail. Nothing could stop me from going there. In 2001, a team of geologists from India's National Institute of Ocean Technology made a series of startling discoveries in the Gulf of Cambay. Their sonar readings show evidence for two huge cities 120 feet underwater. And a sample they've collected from the seabed has been carbon dated to the end of the Ice Age. The NIOT experts aren't archaeologists. They were doing pollution studies in the Thank Gulf. You but what they found is of massive archaeological significance. Sure. Could these flooded cities be the proof I've been looking for which joins the Indian flood myth to archaeology? Initially, when we went, we thought probably we'll be on an early Harappan site, but after seeing all the artifacts and evidences what we have collected, it looks that they are before the Harappan yes. uh, period. Which means, in the end, that history is going to have to be looked at again. Definitely. Maybe this is the beginning of a major uh, discovery for uh, the world. I think so. I think so. It's the scale of the sites which is so exciting. It looks like a twin city or a twin metropolis of right. ancient times. Right, right. The cities are located right in the area that Glen Milne's sea level rise data shows was flooded between seven and 8,000 years ago. This was at the very end of the Ice Age and was the last of three major pulses of meltwater release that have been identified by geologists. One city is more than eight kilometers long. Mm -hmm. Other one is almost nine kilometers. These are enormous. Enormous, yeah. Both of them appear to be along two river courses. A natural river, place for humans to settle. Yeah. 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 Uh, can have a look here. Wow. This is a treasure trove. Next, Dr. Badranarian took me to see some of the artifacts they've recovered by dredging the underwater sites. Uh, these are our uh, micro tools, yep. where you can see various uh, shaped uh, thin objects, well polished to use them for uh, various purposes. This is uh, like a spoon. A spoon, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can see it is the shape of a deer they have made. Well, it's very interesting because it's carved the same on both, on both okay. sides. Human remains include a fossilized jawbone and vertebrae. And the artifacts show that these people were skilled in making pottery, jewelry, and other ornaments. This seems to have been almost like turned on some sort yeah, of... Yeah, it is. It, is a, it appears to be a, a very good artifact. Probably they had a sort of hand uh, mm. instrument to turn all these things. If you see, there's a hole also they are made through that. And, and this hole runs all the way through yeah, it? Completely. Yeah, completely. So this is absolutely, definitively a man-made man -made object. Yeah, we did not know what it was. Most startling of all, a stone slab was discovered with raised markings which could push back the date of the invention of writing to the end of the Ice Age. Yeah. This is some of the images we have picked up in the... Sub-bottom profiling, a technique that detects materials buried beneath the seabed, reveals the city's massive foundations. In between the seabed, We'll be seeing soft material. Right. There's a foundation of which they Which has quite a different character, character from the rest. So this is building foundation. Building foundation. Right. And you can see that they are very regularly Indeed. Fixed. Which are walls, really. Yeah, walls. Yes. I'm, 
But a bigger surprise came from the side scan sonar, a beam passed along the seabed to detect solid objects. The images show sophisticated geometrical structures. It's looking down on the seabed, these very right-angled structures. Yeah. Which... These are about 77 meter by about 40 meter. Yeah. Actually, there's a series of steps going down. It looks like it's buildings. It's not uh, anything that you normally come across in a uh, marine, this no, one. No. It is obviously man-made. Yeah. But Dr. Badranarian had something even more spectacular to show me, which looks like a citadel. Something very different than what you see now. Right. Yeah. Wow. You yeah. see very square features. Yeah. And I can this see a lovely very... series of right angles here. Yeah. They're all platform-like features. Yeah. Uh, the, the present length of this is about 98 meter. We've created a computer simulation of the Citadel. It gives some idea of the ambition and extent of the great buildings for so long lost beneath the waves. How long might this society have existed before it was flooded? All I want to do is go diving right away. But it's December 2001, there's political tension in the neighborhood, and Indian naval intelligence has politely but firmly declined my request to die. Even the NIOT scientists themselves haven't dived yet, and until they do, or someone does, a question mark must hang over the claims that are being made. But the case is getting stronger all the time. A month after I met them, the NIOT released the results of carbon dating on the artifacts recovered from the sunken cities. The results caused a sensation around the world. One of the objects was dated to 7,500 BC. That's four and a half thousand years before the cities of Mesopotamia and Egypt. How long would it have taken a civilization that was already here 9,500 years ago to build cities on this scale? We could be looking at a previously unknown high culture in existence around the coastal margins of India from perhaps as much as 12,000 years ago. And that's precisely the period when the U-shaped structure at the bottom of the Bay of Bengal was last on dry land. If we take the ancient flood myths seriously, instead of writing them off as primitive fantasies as so many archaeologists do, then they can point us towards new discoveries discoveries that could rewrite history. I'm going to head east to put to the test one more set of myths, and a mysterious people who we already know were doing extraordinary things at the end of the Ice Age. More next week, same time. To get Graham Hancock's book, Underworld, price £20, call 0870-1234-344 or go to channel4.com history, where Graham will also be taking part in a live web chat. Give him just a few minutes. Now, a blast of film action adventure is up next. Robert Rodriguez gives his El Mariachi the Hollywood treatment, and it stands up as one brilliant remake. Antonio Bandera, Salma Hayek, and a typically informed Steve Buscemi. It's an absolute rush with Desperado.